It's good to see. Man, everybody's smiling today. Man, there's a bunch of beautiful folks out here. Where'd you all come from? <laughs> it's good to see you today. I hope you have your Bibles and you'll find with me Ephesians chapter 1. We'll take our next step in our study through the book of Ephesians today. And I, I, it's, it's an exciting day in many, many respects. But I want to make sure that we miss, don't miss the significance of what is happening here in the book. In the larger context of the book, we talked about very briefly last week, chapters 1, 2, and 3 tell us the story of the gospel, Jesus' story. We, we, we would oftentimes talk about that from a formal perspective. He's te teaching us about doctrine, the truths of what we can gas grasp and understand regarding God and his word. But let's simplify it to say today that chapters 1 through 3 are giving us the gospel story, the story of Jesus. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 of the book of Ephesians talk about our story, our lives. And what we said last week is the intention of the book of Ephesians, the, the emphasis, the theme of the book of Ephesians is really about how the story of Jesus, chapters 1, through and three, one 2, and 3, affects our story, chapters 4, 5, and 6. And so what we want to do today is sort of step in and understand that from the perspective, but even as we talk about his story... And what he's doing with us, what he's doing, doing for us, and what, he's, what, ultimately, what he ultimately will do for us, even grasping that, there's got to be practical application of how it should affect our lives. And so every time we open up God's Word, I hope you read it daily. I, ho I hope you do. Every time you open up God's Word, you need to be asking yourself a question, what does this have for me today? How would my life, how should it be differently? How should I live my life differently? Is there something in my life that needs to be corrected? Is there maybe a burden or a passion that needs to be fueled within my life? I, I don't know what God does, in, but I do know as you open up God's word and you ask him, Lord, help me to see today what I need to do, what I need to, how I need to respond and how I need to pray differently or whatever it may be. It's amazing how many times God shows up and says, well, if, if you're really serious, this is what you need to do. Because his story must affect our story for the Word of God to be effective as it was designed to be. So with that being said this morning, I'd like to give you a little bit of trivia. Now, everybody likes trivia, right? So, you know, somebody's going to ask you one of these days, what's the longest verse in the Bible? And you're going to, don't put that up yet, you're going to tell them, That's what I thought you would tell them. Yeah, that's close. It's Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 38. Luke chapter, 20, chapter 3, verse 23 through 28, it's really about the genealogy of Jesus, and it's a list of, list of Jesus' ancestors, and it's sort of, you know, it's a whole list of, of names, sort of a run-on sentences, and, and, and begat such and such, you know, and he came from, and, and, and from names that we cannot pronounce ourselves, and we just want to run through oftentimes, but that is the longest sentence in the Bible. So the question then is, what's the second longest sentence in the Bible? I know you know what the shortest sentence is, right? Jesus wept. I, we get that one. But what's the second longest? Matthew 1? No. Oh. Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14, which is where we are today. As a matter of fact, if you were to go look at that in the context in the original language, you'll find that there, there's, the, there's this continuation of thought, and we're going to talk about the significance of that in a few moments, but this continuation of thought of how God has indeed richly blessed us, and Paul sort of runs on for a, a while, verses 3 through 14, to, to sort of celebrate the blessing of God that he has made for us and in us and will ultimately be blessing through us. And so that's where we're going to be spending our time today. And in order for us to be able to, I hope, get a grasp of that, I want to 
take an opportunity to be able to talk about that word blessed. Matter of fact, if you were to read First Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, blessed be the Lord God. And we would see the word blessed or bless or blessing in this passage several times. But if we were to look at the word blessed, we might think, well, we just got through with the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We, we talked about that. We, talked, we spent some time on that. But we didn't really talk about the significance of the word blessing so much then. And, but I want to do a comparison at this point in time because I believe it is significant because it is uniquely different. Matthew chapter 5, uh, Matthew chapter 5 verses 3 through, 4, 3 through 14, 12 actually gives to us an understanding of this blessed. And the word makeros, I guess, would be a, a fair pronunciation for the word that we find in the original language that has to do with this concept of a status or our state. Matter of fact, when we first began the Beatitudes, we talked about the word blessing or the word blessed is the man who's, uh, who's, who is poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, spirit as being someone who has found a sense, a place in their life to be able to find a state of being approved by God, if you remember that. So there's a, there's a position that we would understand the word mekeros most of the time talks about it. It's sort of a positional blessedness. But when we transition over, well, matter of fact, if we were to transition over, we can see in this chapter, Matthew chapter 5, if you, if you would just, just entertain me to go back there, Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 and following, blessed are the poor in spirit, remember that? Blessed are those who mourn, got all that? Yes, are you there? I don't hear your pages turning, but anyway, that's okay. They were silent pages today, I understand, I got that. But if we were to, were to see how blessed changes in Matthew chapter 5, you're going to find a significant change in blessing from Matthew chapter 5 verses 3 through 14, 3 through 12. And when we transition down to Matthew chapter 5 verse 43, matter of fact, the word changes. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies, right? That's easy enough for us to do. We can, we, we, it's easy to like people that like you, Right? It's easy enough for us to do, but Jesus said, I'm calling you as followers of Christ to do something uniquely different than what's natural. So therefore, as a follower of Christ, he says, but I say to you, do not take an, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 but I say to you, everyone who, whoa, hang on a second, where am I at? Verse 43, 44, here it is. You know, these glasses, (laughs) it's amazing when you look at scripture, I can see the words, but the numbers don't show up very well. I've got to, that, that's not saying anything about me getting older. I promise you. But let's go back to verse 44. I found it now. But I say to you, love your enemies. And what's the next word in your, in your Bibles? And, and pray. Uh, pray for those who despitefully use you. Is that what all your Bibles say? Some, some of our Bibles are going to say something along the lines, bless those, who perse- bless those who persecute you. The word bless is inaccurate. It's, better, it's the better translation. Because what we do in Matthew chapter 5 verse 3 is a state of blessedness. Makeros chapter 5 verse 44 is, is, a, is an intention of exercising or acting upon blessing. It, 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 it speaks about a, a, an idea for us to be able to, to act in such a way, to call down God's favor, to consecrate, to praise, to act kindly towards someone. That's the idea of that second word that we oftentimes get our word eulogy from. As a matter of fact, you can almost see eulogy in the, in the word there. Many times in a funeral, we would actually talk about a eulogy, maybe about reading a, an obituary possibly, but a eulogy formally is something more than that. Eulogy is simply saying something nice and kind about the individual whom you're eulogizing or those who you're blessing. So God calls us, those of us who are in the state of blessedness, makeros, to act differently and to bless those who are not kind to us. You, or do you see that? 
So there's a state or a position of blessedness, but there's an action that God is calling us to do. And so when we take that idea back to chapter, chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians, you're going to find the book of Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we're called upon to bring blessing to extol, to exalt, to, to lift high, to, to bless the name of the Lord. That's what we call to do. And then the rest of the verse, verses 3 through 14 is really telling us the foundation or the why or giving us fuel for the blessing that we're giving or ought to be giving to God. The scripture says in blessed chapter three, chapter 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. What God did for us is he has now acted upon, he's brought favor to our life, he's given to us, he's choosing to extol, he's choosing to bless us and encourage us, shine his favor upon us, and when we have God's favor upon us, it becomes more natural for us to simply bless the Lord, right? If he's good to us, wouldn't it be natural for us just to be respond and favor and love and blessing and adoration and worship. And Paul talks about that aspect. And so this morning, our time together today is going to be talking about the Father's purpose. And I, I want to say it this way. God has a plan for your life, a purpose, an intentional purpose for your life. And that purpose this morning, we're going to discover some of that as we think about this passage and we understand something of the significance of the blessing that God is bringing to your life and to my life, and we begin to see within it the blessing and the purpose for the Almighty. Matter of fact, 12 times we're going to find this statement in, in the Scripture in Christ because, first of all, the blessing that we understand significant with Christ is really wrapped up in this one word, as we are in union, letter A in your notes, as we are in union with Christ. Twelve different times in, 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 in these verses, we find Paul mentioning statements that talks about this spiritual union in Christ, with Christ. And so much so that when we read this, it almost becomes, we become almost numb to the significance of of what God is seeking to do. And may, may I just caution us this morning not to grow numb in seeing something repeated. As a matter of fact, it ought to draw attention to that because it ought to help us to see that in this particular thing, if he repeats it time and time and time again, he's bringing significance to it. And so what he's wanting to say to you and I is because we find ourselves in this relationship, in this union with Christ, there is inherited blessing within that reunion, and that's what we're going to be talking about over the next little while. Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of creation, the Lord of lords, the glo Lord of glory, has, has, has invited us into a relationship with him. He is absolutely Lord. He's risen from the grave. He's gained power over sin and death. He is seated presently in the, with the heavens, in, in the heavens with the Father. He has all the power and privileges that exceed anything we've ever seen on earth. And we will have the privilege to share in his glory. And, and it's all because God has invited us to become in Christ, in this union with him. He's the head of all things. And he's going to give you and I the privilege to be joint heirs with Christ. You know, we struggle sometimes to see the significance of things. We, we do. I, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, Karen, what's the song that John Ross sings? Huh? The lion in, the, there's a line in my lungs. Come on, help me somebody. Where's, pra, where's, my, where's my praise team at? There's a, that's... Hallelujah. Anyway, that's a song. We uh, raise a hallelujah, right? Raise a hallelujah. No, it's not raise a hallelujah. Gratitude. Thank you. I knew it was one of those G words. Anyway, we had the privilege last night, as we have in several times, to have our two grandsons over to spend the night with us. They, they had a sleepover with Grandpa and Grandma. And uh, this is always a neat time. And part of Sarah and Josh's discipline in their 
family time is at night time they read the Bible read the Bible with their kids and then they spend some time praying and they also have a song which we didn't do all the time with our kids but they have a song because at least their dad can sing <laughs> I can't so it, I don't have a whole lot to offer here but anyway but there have been times that I have we've sang that song uh, gratitude there's a line within yeah, I can't remember all the lyrics of that and you have to help me with that maybe you know that better than I do and I've sort of sung it in church several times we have as a church family and and I've always enjoyed it but the first time John Ross sang it at our home I wept because all of a sudden that song and the words are powerful but that song had brought a new meaning because there was a sense of significance brought to it. We miss. How many times have we seen the beauty of a sunset and just saw, thought it was okay? And then somewhere along the line, wow. And when I think about this passage and I think about the reunion that God has invited us into, I wonder sometimes if we get to the place that it becomes so commonplace that we lose the significance of it. But I want you to grasp today as much as I know how to help us grasp today that you and I have been invited into a relationship with Christ and we have no understanding of the blessing that brings to us. I think secondly, not only have we been blessed because of this union, but we are blessed as we are in, here's the next fill in the blank, in heaven with Christ. And you think, whoa, 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 pastor, I'm not there yet. Next fill in the blank is heaven. I'm not there yet, but the reality is God has called us into this relationship, and while we've not yet got there, we are guaranteed of being there as much as if we were already there. It's much like this. If you've ever traveled with your children, you know, you can, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to travel with children. It will help your patience grow deeply. But I remember some of those trips. We would talk about we're going to go to the beach, for instance, and our kids, you know, we would hype up for, we'd pack our suitcases or pack our beach bag or whatever it is. If since we're in Florida, we can get there in a very short time. And uh, we can go, but, you know, we barely get out of the driveway before the first question happens. And what's the first question? So your kids did the same. Yeah. And no, we're not there, but we're almost there. But now, how about now? Are we there now? No, we're not there, but we're almost there. You know, that, that already but not yet kind of idea, that concept that Scripture teaches us and helps us to be able to see that while we may not yet be in glory, we all participate in glory. There's something that we have today that's, that's ours because we're in relationship with Christ that ultimately we may not never see the, under, the full understanding until we get there. But the reality is, even as Paul tried to say, eyes have not seen or ears heard nor entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for, the, for those who love him. While we have not quite understood it to its fullness, one day we will, but God has given us glimpses of it today. why I love that story and I, I know most of you probably have heard the story but tolerate with me if I can for just a moment while I share that for those those few that may not there was a pastor that was called upon to do a funeral for a lady that had passed away and she went by to meet the lady that was that was in the process of passing and she, she talked to her about the pastor with what service she wanted and that kind of stuff. And one of the things she said at the very end of the conversation, she says, Pastor, I want to make sure that if you would please make sure. I've told my children, but I'm not sure they're going to do that. But I want you to make sure that when I'm in the casket that there's a fork in my hand. And the pastor thought for just a few moments. And he said, why in the world would you want a fork in your hand? And she said, well, pastor, you know this. We as Baptists love to eat. Amen? And those fellowship dinners that we have at church, when she talked about an, a, a sister such and such that had already passed on, used to come and gather the plates. You know, we've got Junior Daly, bless, bless his heart, he is so faithful. Gene Smart yesterday in our, in our funeral meal follow-up was so faithful to come around and start gathering plates up as we sort of finish our meal. 
But sister so-and-so, apparently as she gathered the plates up, used to say to the people as she was gathering the plate, keep your fork. Why? Because the best is yet to come. The dessert, you know, if the rapture ever comes, we better eat our dessert first. I I, I could miss a meal, but I don't want to miss a dessert. Amen? Amen? The reality is while we've not yet got there, The reality is, while we've not yet fully experienced it, it is ours as if we're already there. The deposit and guarantee has been made. And in Scripture, we see even Paul mentioning here, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, not most, but every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He is present in glory, and one day we will join him in glory. And all the blessings that come from glory are ours to know today, even though we have not quite experienced them all till we get there. So we have this precious blessedness that comes from this union but we also have verses four and five this blessedness that comes with the status that we have because we are his and that status first of all comes from our his sanctity Christ's sanctity that we should be notice what it says in verse four even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be here's two words don't miss Holy and blameless before him. Holy and blameless. Tandem benefits of our union with Christ, this two, twofold description of this growth process of the sanctification of God at work in our lives as he is bringing about something for us, something being removed from our life and something then being supplied to our life. We have, first of all, the blame being removed. I've often heard it said that uh, Scripture tells us in, in Isaiah and other places that God keeps a record of our wrongdoing. He always does, always has, and always will. Revelation chapter 20, matter of fact, says that those, of who, are not, those who are not part of the Lamb's book of life, those who have never accepted Christ to be the personal Savior, God has a record of all of our deeds But for those who do not know Christ their Savior, their deeds are going to be the justification for the judgment that's coming. So God has a record of all of our deeds. The reality is, if it were me, and it is me today I'm talking about, he doesn't need one bucket, he doesn't need two buckets or three buckets, he probably needs a whole row of buckets that I, much more than I've got today. But let's suffice it to say The reality is, is that if you were to take my life and the actions that I've done, the words that I've spoken and the thoughts that I've thought, they would fill those buckets up many times over. But for our time together today, let's suffice it to say that these are a bucket containing, these are buckets containing the things that I have thought, said, or done wrong. And even things that I didn't do that I should have done. It contains all of those. The reality is in life, is it's not only God who keeps records, but sometimes we do. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 13. Can you turn there with me real quick? 1 Corinthians 13. Great passage. I love 1 Corinthians 13. We, we use that passage at weddings a lot of times to remind husbands and wives that they're to love each other. <laughs> love is patient, right? Love is kind, <laughs> It's not always, sometimes we have to work on that. It's not natural sometimes, you know, but verse 4 says, 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and kind. It does not envy, nor does it boast. It does not, it's not arrogant, nor is it rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. Where do fights come from among us because we're not getting our way? Does not insist on our own way. It is not irritable, nor is it translations. My translation says resentful. What does yours say? Talk to me. Pardon? Irritable. Irritable. Well, resentful is one after irritable. 
here, here's, let me, let me, let me, so I, so we don't get caught up here. Let me say that the word resentful, irritable, resentful really mean, the word resentful there really means it keeps no records of wrong. Does anybody, anybody's translation have that? Maybe a few. I think the New Living Translation actually talks about keeps no records of wrong. And the truth of the matter is, we do that pretty well, don't we? I, I, we do. We, we, we can look back and uh, we could talk about the things that, that I, I know a lot of the stuff that I've done wrong. The reality, my wife has a list of things I've done wrong as well. And she's done one thing wrong in life probably, and that was probably to marry me. But uh, needless to say, uh, but here's what I've learned about life is that you know, I want to go fishing today. Watch out here. Here's what I learned about the re, you know why we keep records of wrong? And this is the reason why is because sometimes we need to fish into the bucket of the people that we love or the people that we know, and we need to pull out something they've done wrong because it gives us leverage over them in relationships. So we keep a record because we can power up through those records of wrong and remind them that you remember when you, <laughs> you ever had that been said to you? It allows us to fish into the bucket of other people's lives to sort of pull out that nugget of thing that they did wrong so that we can use it for our advantage when we need to use it for our advantage. And that happens in relationships, right? It does. I know it probably doesn't in your husband and wife relationship. None of that's ever happened because we've, we've learned the principles of Scripture says keeps, love keeps no record of wrong, and we've learned to do that, right? Amen? Wasn't quite as <laughs> confident with that amen, but needless to say, what I do know about relationships is we have a tendency to ha keep records because at times we need that peace because it will be to our advantage in a conflict that may arise somewhere along the way let's take that principle back to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and here's the word blameless blameless God gives us an opportunity in this journey of life to be able to find ourselves before him as as with knowing that we've done everything wrong in our lives we he's got a record he knows it all but God gives us the opportunity in this journey of life that God allows us the the, the etch-a-sketch moment of life when we accept Christ to be our personal savior everything that we've ever done in the past everything we're doing in the present everything we'll do in the future God erases from our record and God considers us blameless before the throne of the living God wow wow he gives us the opportunity and why how does he do that can I ask you to turn back with me to the other Corinthians 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 you know this passage pretty well 2nd Corinthians 5 17 says but if any man be in Christ he is a new creation old things are passed away behold how many things are all all means and that's all all means all things are becoming new verse 18 we don't know as well but let's look, follow along all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the minister of reconciliation that it is in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against him. That's where we talk about. But entrusting to us the message of re reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, making a, this his appeal through, as, as God was making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Why? For our sake, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. What Jesus Christ did, the Bible says to us very clearly in Scripture, is that in all ways he was tempted just like we were, and yet without what? Without sin. He did no wrong. Yet Jesus Christ was nailed to an old rugged cross, and when he was nailed to an old rugged cross, his, his blood shed. 
was shed for the payment of our sin, but had, it, had he been a faulted Savior, a Savior who had sins, Maybe there would have been a temporary payment, but there could not have been anything further. But since Jesus was the perfect God-man and he had never sinned, the Bible teaches us clearly that God took in that moment his righteousness, the coat of righteousness, the cloak of righteousness, the white robe of perfection, and when he did so, he clothed, took our lives and covered our lives with his righteousness so that as we stand before God, we stand before God as one being righteous that we were not, but because our Savior was. And so when and if even God decided he wanted to take and fish into our fault, the scripture would teach us clearly that he cannot fish into our faults any longer, and he's not going to do that anyway. But even if he chose to, he's not going to fish in our, in our faults any longer because they're all taken care of by the blood of Jesus and covered up with the righteousness of God so that we can stand before him as perfect and complete. In Christ, we have his sanctity. Third, secondly, in Christ, we also have his sonship. Back with me in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In, in love, he predestined us for the adoption as sons. He allows you and I the privilege to be joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ, not because we deserve to, not because we've measured up to, but because in love he has determined that we would be invited into a relationship with him and we would ultimately be his children. So we are sons and daughters of God if you know Christ is your personal Savior. Grace and peace came to us from God our Father and grace applied into our life allowed us the privilege of being sons and daughters. And we have, thirdly, this opportunity to be blessed in Christ alone. Oh, I love this passage. I don't want you to miss this. Maybe the most important thing I'll have to say today may be wrapped up in what we're getting ready to say, so don't miss this, please. As this passage continues on, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. I want you to read that passage carefully with me once more again. Verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons according to the purpose of his will. Tell me in that passage what your role or my role was. Nothing. Nothing. Because you and I need to understand and grasp this. If, 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 uh, if you miss everything else, we need to grasp this. Salvation has come to you and to me without human cause at all. You did not measure up. I didn't measure up. I didn't get good enough. I cannot get good enough. I didn't do enough right things. I didn't do enough good things. I, I, I cannot do that because this old body is filled with, with, with the old nature, the sinful nature, and everything that I've done and I will do is polluted by that sinful nature. But bless be God, God chose to love me in spite of me and chose to invite me into a relationship all because he initiated that relationship and he's invited me, granted to me the faith I need to be able to trust him, and ultimately, he has saved me. And I didn't do anything. Because I can't. That's why Paul would say later on in Ephesians chapter 2, we were dead in our trespasses and sin. Dead men don't walk. Dead men don't rise up. Dead men don't participate. We were dead in our trespasses and sin, and God in his grace chose to love us. I just, if you don't, I think the most amazing thing that you and I can ever grasp is the fact that God chose you. I, I, I know every, every bit of the ugly in me. I'm reminded of it often. The enemy does a really good job in my life to remind me of my faults, and he probably does you as well. And even when the enemy doesn't remind me of my faults, I remember them pretty vividly. There's things I wished I could forget. 
But dear friend, please hear this. You and I were chosen before when? When does the scripture say in verse 4? Before the foundation of the, before creation, God knew everything about you. He knew every ugly word you would say. He knew every ugly deed you would do. He knew every ugly thought that would go through your mind even before creation. And God chose you then. He chose us then. He chose to love you even in spite of yourself. When you're having one of those pity parties in life and the enemy's trying to beat you up or maybe you've got friends around you that are trying to beat you up. Maybe they're fishing in the pond of your wrongdoing. How many of you all have done some wrong things in life? Even when they're fishing in the pond of your wrongdoing to remind you of the faults of your life. There's one thing that you and I need to be reminded of is in spite of all of that. He chose us. This last passage, this last part says this. He's done that because of one reason. He predestined us according to the purpose of his will. But back up with me if you can. Verse 4, because we miss really the beginning of the phrase in verse 5 if we don't read verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. It was in what? Love. That he predestined us for the adoption of sons according to, according to, through, through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace which, we, which with he has blessed us in the beloved. Salvation comes not only without human effort, it also comes through divine love alone. You know, I hear people sometimes say, you know, we, we get gathered together in chapel with our preschoolers sometimes, and you'll, you'll hear the preschoolers ask, do you love Jesus? And everybody loves Jesus as a preschooler. You come to church, you, do you love Jesus? Yeah, you, everybody loves Jesus when you come to church. You know, the guy who knew Jesus probably best, probably the most intimate relationship Jesus had was guy, guy what we call the Apostle John. He was, he was, he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. I, I think probably equated that really was, he was probably closer to Jesus than any of the rest. But as John was writing his letters to the church, he wrote three letters to the church first second and third John as he was writing the first letter to the church we call it the epistles of first John as he was writing the first letter to John he made this profound statement that we need never lose sight of and here's this statement we love him because he first loved us you and I didn't wake up one morning and said today I'm going to choose to love God no, what happened in our life was that we all of a sudden became aware. The Bible, Romans chapter 2, says that the love of God constrains us. It draws us. We may have woke up one day and we realized maybe for the first time in our life that there was something that, that God was, was, was working in my heart. There's conviction in my life. There's something going on, on the inside that I, I sensed and knew even in the midst of all. Maybe in a service like this that all of a sudden that you realize and the enemy keeps reminding you of all the things you've done wrong. You, maybe you've come out of a relationship with somebody that continued to tell you that all the things you've done wrong. And But today for the very first time maybe ever in your life you're hearing that while you have done things wrong, God chooses to love you in spite of it. And it's that love of God that draws us into a relationship with him. And therefore, we respond in love because God chooses to love us first. And so it's this divine love that gives us an opportunity to be able to know him and an opportunity to respond appropriately to him. And by way of application, I'd like to just to cause you to ponder a little bit today. And here's first point I'd like for you to think about today is this. Considering that God chose you. In the light of your life and choices, 
how could his choice have been different? Would there ever been a time, look, you look back at your own life, and we've been here. You've come so far with this person in your relationship, you finally draw a line in the sand and said, no further, I'm done. Let me ask you a question. Could God have drawn a line in the sand for you too? Oh yeah, he could have. Justifiably, he should have for me. But in spite of the fact of my life and my decisions, and God could have made other choices, and he probably should have made other choices, but he chose to love me in spite of me, considering how he chose you, how do we need to respond? What's appropriate to respond? And then this last point, maybe it's maybe restating that statement, if, if you would please, a little bit differently. Here's this last point. Have you really considered the full measure of God's love? Have you tried to measure it? Was it 2 pounds, 20 pounds, 4,200 pounds? Okay, have you ever tried to measure it? You know, the songwriter tries to say that we're, we're the, you know, the, we're, we're the, was the love of God measured in drops of water? The oceans could not have filled it. Have you ever tried to measure it? And considering God chose to love you in spite of yourself and even how, how much he gave, how much love, how much grace, we are saved by grace. That not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. Measuring out that grace, what must you do to respond to an awesome expression of love and grace? Here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians, Ephesians 1.3. Thinking about what God is doing for us in verse, the last part of verse 3 forward. I back up to the beginning of verse 3 that says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It ought to bring about worship. It ought to bring about celebration. Gratitude for what he's done. But how about you? Has there been a time in your life that you know for sure... That God's grace has been extended to you. It has been, whether you realized it or not, it has been. Have you come to the place in your life that you've ever opened up your heart and allowed Christ to come in and save you, to wash away your sin debt? Do you realize you're going to stand before God one day? Every one of us are. Philippians 2 says, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and to the glory of God the Father. Here's what happens so many times in life is we get to the place and we want to, we want to do it on our time and our way. And, you know, we may, we may sense God's draw at times and we sense God's draw and we continue to push back and push back and wait, wait for another day, a more convenient day. But one of these days, those days are going to run out. Could this be your day? Could it? I'm going to ask you if you would to stand to your feet, heads bowed and eyes closed across this room today as our praise team makes their way to the stage. No one looking around today, and I'm not going to ask, I'm not going to ask to, your questions to embarrass you other than simply to say this. Do you know Christ as your personal Savior? And if not, why not today? And you might say, Pastor, why should I? Well, just think about the buckets on behind me. And the record of all the things that you've done. And God has that record. Do you want it all cleaned up? Do you want Christ covering over top of it? Or do you want to stand before God on your own merit? The choice is yours. And the choice might be made today what will your choice be father we bless you today and we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to be able to hear your word and to respond faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God would you grant us today the opportunity to respond appropriately to the outpouring of your love and grace into our lives 
there's none of us in this room without sin. I'm grateful that most of us in this room have had the covering of Jesus already applied to our lives. And for those of us who have and already understand the beauty of forgiveness, Father, I pray that you'd help us to celebrate you greater. That we might find a way that when temptation comes our way, that we would find an empowerment to be able to stand against temptation because of the good things you've already given to us. But maybe for those that have never met you as Savior, would today be the day that you would minister to their heart in such a way that, God, they might choose today to open their heart to you. For every one of us today, it's a time of decision. It's a time of response. The question really stands is what today will we do with Jesus and his gift of grace to us? Use this time to honor and glorify your precious name, we pray in Jesus' name.